This program is brought to you by the partners of A Root Awakening International. Help others find truth. Support A Root Awakening International today. In his epistle to the Romans, Paul says blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Today, the tables have turned. Misinterpretation of the scriptures has blinded modern Gentiles, creating a false narrative of the Messiah and an evangelistic holocaust by which the blind lead the blind down a path to destruction. Tonight, Michael Rood takes the blinders off to reveal how to turn it around. It's the first episode of The Blindness of the Gentiles because it's the end of the sixth day. The sun is set and this is Shabbat Night Live. Well, Shabbat Shalom to our fans. Welcome to Shabbat Night Live, another week in quarantine. And uh, we have a, a special presentation tonight because, Michael, it is the first episode of your new series, which is The Blindness of the Gentiles. Now, we've always heard that the, you know, the Jews were, blind, uh, were blinded, but what's this all about, the, the Gentiles being blinded? Well, this was really inspired, I would say, 50 years ago. I read the book of Acts, and I read it all the way through, and I saw the power of God alive in those first century believers like I had never seen in my entire life of going to church at that point. And so after, after really digging into this, I decided that I was going to have to put myself in the same position as as these believers were in the first century, if I were going to see the miracles. So I, I looked around at the, the church, the congregation, all the elders there, and I realized that if I stayed here and I learned everything from the word of, of God that they knew, if I really disciplined myself to learn everything they knew, I would have the same power of God, I'd have the same zest for living, the same uh, just intensity that I see in them. And so... I left and never went back. I'm assuming you didn't see much. <laughs> I, I, I didn't see anything. I'd, I'd sat in that church pew for 17 years and never seeing a prayer answered, never seeing a miracle happen. And uh, But I knew that the scriptures were real. And so that's what set me on this path 50 years ago this year. And so I've been waiting really 50 years to, to teach this because really, you know, Scott, I had to live these things. I had to volunteer. I volunteered for the Marine Corps, volunteered to go to Vietnam. I volunteered, and, and this was really volunteering uh, to the Almighty that I want to be your servant. Just like I prayed and asked when I was in second grade, I asked that he would use me as a servant, and this began the adventure that now I can uh, I can unpack the, the book of Acts because uh, this is what I've attempted to live for the last 50 years. And so I'm, I'm so excited about this. And as a matter of fact, uh, Scott, uh, this week, uh, to coincide with what we're doing for Shabbat Night Live, I started, uh, it's not really Shabbat Night Live, it's Sunday Morning Live. I'm broadcasting to China and Taiwan. We're going live, it's being translated live. And so the Assembly of Believers in the East is all coming to pass. And something I realized as I was teaching this week is that the, the Chinese version, because once in a while I say, okay, what does it say in Chinese? And they interpret it for me. And I realized that, see, the Chinese being an Eastern culture, they, they actually have the scriptures more accurate in some areas than we do in English or Spanish or German, because it's still an Eastern culture. And so I'm able to unravel things and unpack things uh, to the Chinese believers because they have gone through great persecution. You know, their parents, their grandparents were tortured. Their, their, their parents and grandparents were, were killed. The 60 million 
Chinese were killed by Mao Zedong. These are the offspring. They know what it's like. And now they're living in a culture in which there's a camera watching them at every corner. They're tracking these people with every move that they make. And they know, as I'm teaching the book of Revelation, to them it makes sense. It means something. And only now in America, with this coronavirus, are people beginning to understand exactly what I laid out in the mystery of iniquity 25 years ago. I, I laid all this stuff out. And so it's like, I, I don't need to say anything about the coronavirus, really, you know, because I already said it over 20 years ago. If people will read it, and if they will listen to my teaching on the mystery of iniquity, then it'll all all make sense. But this book of Acts, this is the most important trek that I have been on in my life. And finally, I get to lay this out to the, the saints here in America. That's amazing that you're even able to uh, get to the China. I'm surprised, actually, that you're able to do a live teaching uh, to the folks in China, that they're able to get that signal. That's just wonderful that you're able to do that. We, we know there are, are thousands in Taiwan, but we have no idea how many are in China because they're all on virtual private networks. In order to get uh, uh, any information, to, to get to the West, to get our message, they have to be on VPNs, virtual private networks, and so you can't tell where they're from. They may show up that they're from Iceland or some other place because they, they take on that, that identity so that nobody can see them and so they can get past all of the, 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 the filters, all the firewalls, uh, if you please. Indeed, that is becoming... I, mean, this is, I was going to say that's becoming more popular here in the, in the West as well now. And it's probably going to become a necessity here in the West. We've got we've got a window of opportunity right now, and that's why we went on our app because we know they're shutting down the window in many of the public venues that we are still broadcasting on right now. But we know that that that's soon to come to an end because uh, uh, they they they've got they they've got their thought police in place, and um, and so. Where we we pray and we ask people to pray and stand with us as as we are uh, on this final rush. There's a day coming that no man can work. It's just going to be pure survival. This is not it. The COVID virus is not it. Okay, it's a it's a foreshadow. It's just a taste, and we're seeing what they plan to put in place uh, to combat this. It's not really combating that. It's to gain control over the population. And they're using us with every bit. Every politician is now who wants to be in power, who wants to be the indisputable power upon planet Earth, is grabbing everything that they can right now to shut down free speech, free thought, and to bring in their plan uh, for lowering the population. Honestly, just as Bill Gates said, we need to bring about a, a, um, a vaccine that will lower the population. Why he said that, we're only beginning now to understand. But years ago, he said, we, we need to bring in a vaccine uh, because the population uh, on planet Earth needs to be brought down. Hmm. Indeed, we are talking with a, a doctor on uh, later this month. We're going to be broadcasting it in middle middle of June, and that is Dr. Rashid Batar, and he has a lot to say about that as well. So I think that anyone who's watching this tonight is going to find that very interesting uh, in addition. Oh, they have got to... Uh, you worked hard to get this. I mean, you know, he is jammed up because people all over the world want to know what he is saying. And finally, you were able to get him. He's going to be on the air with you uh, for Health Awakening. We're, we're going to expand this. We're going to we're, we're going to let you guys, if you want, Shabbat Night Live, because we really do need to get this information out there. But a lot of people are already awake. You know, that, that was it. The rude awakening happened over 20 years ago. There are some people that are just catching on right now and just learning that the scriptures have told us all about this in advance. But our job, where we are, we are living in the book of Acts. We are; These are the, the last chapters of the book of the Acts of the Jewish Apostles. And now the Gentiles have been added in to the Acts of the Jewish Apostles. Well, and indeed, tonight you're about to rip the blinders off. It is time for the first episode of The Blindness of the Gentiles. And first, we're going to have the kiddish with Michael. And take a look at our new love gift. Here it is. Oh. 
All through the Bible, we are reminded that the Almighty standard of holiness differs greatly from man's self-imposed rules. These are the commandments of God. You keep the commandments of God. Everything over here, these are the commandments of men. This is the plumb line. You don't keep the commandments of men. Michael Root presents Defiled, an insider's look at why the turning of water into wine was so disastrous to the Pharisees' man-made rules. And the only way you can see it is to accept it as our gift, to say thank you for your support. We'll send you Defiled in your choice of DVD or Blu-ray when you send a love gift donation of $50 in the month of May. Or for a gift of $100, we'll send you Defiled plus a stunning Torah Scroll Shadow Box. Or for a gift of $300, we'll send you the teaching, the shadow box, and a stunning model of the Second Temple. Act now. These gifts are available only in May. Call the number on your screen or visit monthlylovegift.com. The Apostle Paul said that Yeshua nailed the dogmas, the doctrines and commandments of men, of the arche and exousia, that he overcame, that he nailed their commandments, their man-made dogmas to the cross. And because of that, we are not to allow any of the arche and exousia, any of the religious authorities of men who made up their own commandments to judge us because every one of the feasts of the Lord are prophetic shadow pictures of good things to come. So don't let any pagan, let no religious authority judge you concerning the Sabbath, the new moons. And on the Sabbath, we do not allow the world to judge us and tell us what to do. We know that Yeshua paid the price for us. And the last night he was with his disciples when he took the bread and he blessed the Most High with this blessing, Baruch Atah Yehovah Heleno Melech HaOlam Hamotzi Lechem Hinaretz. He said, this represents my body, which is now broken for you. As often as you do this, you do it in remembrance of him. And then Yeshua took the cup, and he said, this represents the renewed covenant in my blood. This is what this represents. This is what it's always represented. Do this in remembrance of me. And he said that prayer, Baruch Atah Yehovah Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Borei Pari HaGafen. Blessed are you, Yehovah, our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. And he said, do this in remembrance of me and don't let anyone disparage you. Do this until I come again, because I have made you priests and kings. Shabbat Shalom. This is the blindness of the Gentiles and the reconciliation of Israel. Please take your Bibles and turn to the book of the Acts of the Jewish Apostles. And why I say the Acts of the Jewish Apostles is because this book has been so badly tortured by Gentiles and Gentile Christians who are completely outside of the the culture and the understanding of what the book of Acts is all about, that it has provoked me to jealousy. As the scriptures say, the blindness in part has happened to Israel to provoke the Jews to jealousy. And what has provoked me to teach on the book of Acts, and this has really been, uh, been heavy on me for months now, is that a couple of years ago, after returning from Israel, I started to go to Bible studies and Sunday school classes, going to churches and hearing from a Gentile perspective what they understand about the Bible. And as I have put myself in that particular position, it's been very difficult for me to just sit there and keep my mouth shut. It has been a great restraint upon myself because I realize that this very scripture that we read about in Romans, uh, 
that blindness in part has happened to Israel, blindness in part, to provoke then the Gentiles will then be brought into the faith and the Gentiles will provoke the Jews to jealousy. Well, jealousy means to be vigilant and fiercely protective of one's rights or possessions. And this is what was happening. I was becoming fiercely protective and vigilant over the rights, over these scriptures the that were given to Israel, the oracles of God, the living oracles of God, the word of God was committed to the Jews, and they were the ones supposed to get the word out to the rest of the world. And we see that in the book of the Acts, as I would listen to Gentiles interpret this, and I, I, I just became just kind of enraged. I became fiercely protective of those rights and those possessions that belong to Israel. See, I was raised in a Western world, and it wasn't until I was 17 years of age that I began to become reconnected with the Hebrew roots of my faith, the Jewish roots of my faith. And when that happened, it was a long process. I had been raised in a Gentile Christian world, and this is the perspective that I had. And the replacement theology that is all part of Western Gentile churchianity, that was a part of my life, but but there were things that just couldn't be put together in the scripture. I, I couldn't get the answers that I was looking for. And when I was eight years of age, my mother prompted me to ask the pastor the the question that I had been bothering her for for several days uh, leading up to the Easter service. I said, "Uh, Mother, how do you get three days and three nights between Good Friday and Easter Sunday? And she, she prompted me to ask the pastor after the Easter service, and I found out that he didn't have the answer. And it was going to be eight more years before I began uh, to latch on to the answers and to get the answers. And so it was going back to the Hebrew roots of the faith, back to the biblical reckoning of time, back to a, a, a Hebrew understanding of the Gospels that we then can Count the one sign that Yeshua said would prove that he is the Messiah, the one proof of his authenticity, the sign of Jonah. Three days and three nights in the grave and raised on the third day. But yet, in all of my religious upbringing, I knew that I couldn't count to three. And by eight years of age in second grade, I knew that nobody can count three days and three nights in a resurrection on the third day out of Good Friday to Easter Sunday. So that's when the quest began. And by the time I was 17 years of age, when I opened the book of Acts, then I began to understand. See, the book of Acts is the Acts of the Jewish apostles. The Jewish apostles were the ones that gave their lives to get the good news out to the Gentile world. This is not a Gentile book. It wasn't written by Gentiles. And even though they attempt to in theological seminary, in every Sunday school class, they try to get the book of Luke written by a Gentile, Luke, Gentile physician, that's what they will tell you. And the book of Acts written by a Gentile physician, that only comes from not understanding the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. Because in the book of Acts, it tells us exactly where Luke or Lucius is and what part he plays in the early church that is established out of the synagogue at Antioch and then spreads throughout the Gentile world. Well, I want to take you into that. I want to to open this up that 
it, it took 50 years of my life to, to be able to read and to understand this, and, and uh, now I have to do it without my Bible, that uh, for 45 years I had made copious notes in every margin of a quadruple-wide, quadruple-margin Oxford uh, Bible, and uh, that was uh, stolen out of my vehicle, and so I don't have that anymore. And so I'm going to do it the hard way. I'm going to actually read it from the King James Version of the Bible, and I had to rely upon my memory to be able to supply the, the Greek and, and sometimes even the Hebrew, that if we check the Greek words and go back into the Septuagint, then we get from the Septuagint, then we have the Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures. And so after 50 years of doing this, I'm going to now attempt to give you an insight into the book of Acts that I think that will remove the blindness that has come upon the Gentiles. Blindness in part happened to Israel, but the blindness to the Gentiles is very profound. And I would like to start out with Romans. This is Paul's letter to the Romans. And as we read in chapter 11 and verse one, has God cast away his people, Israel? That's the question. Has God cast away his people, Israel? God forbid, God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. This is the tribe of which Jeremiah came from, the land of Anatot, of the tribe of Benjamin. And so God, has he cast away Israel? He says, no, no, I am an Israelite, he says. I am of the seed of Abraham. And I too am of the seed of Abraham. I'm not of the tribe of Benjamin, but I am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham. God has not cast away the people, his people, whom he foreknew. He was the one that inspired David to write, God showed his ways unto Moses, but his acts unto the children of Israel. Israel saw his actions, what he did, but he showed his ways to Moses behind the scenes. And he said that the Almighty divided the nations divided the nations at the Tower of Babel according to the number of the sons of Israel, who were not going to be born for generations yet. But in the foreknowledge of Almighty God, he had selected a people, the offspring of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and Jacob who is renamed Israel, and his 12 sons, and they were the ones that were then brought out of Egypt with a mighty band of Gentiles as well, a mixed multitude who were baptized in the Red Sea, and then for seven weeks, they made their way to Mount Sinai where the Almighty shouted down his commandments. He shouted down his commandments from the flaming mountain on the day that would become the Feast of Seven, Shavuot. Seven Sabbaths, we made our way to Mount Sinai, and then the Almighty then shouted down in the hearing of everyone his commandments. And this is when the Almighty sanctified his people and said, if you will keep my commandments, you will be a nation of priests and kings. You will be my segula, you will be my protected treasure. I will keep you in the palm of my hand and no one will touch you, if you will keep my commandments. And that's when the first covenant was offered, 
The first covenant was accepted, and then the Almighty shouted down his commandments, and then after that, Moses went up into the mountain, received more of the instructions, came down and wrote those instructions in a scroll and sprinkled the blood of bulls upon the scroll, upon the people, and upon the altar, and said, this is the blood covenant. This is the blood covenant to the people that Yehovah foreknew. This is the people that he selected. He chose beforehand. He even divided the nations up at the Tar Babel according to the number of the yet unborn sons of Israel. And so these people whom God foreknew, he has not forsaken them. He has not put them away. He has not cast them away. God forbid. But this is what is taught in mainline churchianity, in Gentile churchianity. God has rejected Israel, he's cast them away. All the promises made to Israel, they are null and void to them, but they are all accessible and available to Gentiles who are disobedient. Well, God forbid. Paul goes on in verse 11. Have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall or through their stumbling, because remember, this stumbling is about the cornerstone that is set, the cornerstone that men stumble upon. That cornerstone is the Messiah. And Israel stumbled at that cornerstone. That cornerstone that 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 we understood that the Messiah, the son of David, would be the one who would rule over the entire earth with the rod of iron. He would rule over with absolute righteousness and the war would be filled with the knowledge of God. But it was also spoken by David and the prophets that this son of David, this Messiah, would also be the suffering servant. He would also be as a lamb before his shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth, that, that he would be the payment, the propitiation for our sin, our broken covenant at Mount Sinai. We didn't get it all. Israel didn't get it all, and unfortunately, the Gentiles still don't get it. They still don't understand this that Israel was promised a Messiah who would reign from the throne of David over the entire earth. But we stumbled at that because he came the first time not as the Messiah who would rule the earth with a rod of iron, but he came the first time as Moses prophesied and promised. The prophet, he came as the prophet who would come up rise up from among the people, and he would be the prophet, the prophet that all men must hear and obey. Because he would speak not his own words, he would only speak the words of the Heavenly Father. He would know him face to face as Moses knew the Almighty face to face. He would never speak presumptuously. This, this prophet, he would only speak, that's what he was commanded, and the people are required to Shema, required to hear and obey him. And as Moses was given this prophecy, we see that when Yeshua came, he followed the law of Moses explicitly. Number one, no one adds and no one subtracts to the commandments given to us at Mount Sinai by Moses, because these are the commandments of the Almighty. You don't add or subtract from them because adding or subtracting destroys the Torah. It destroys the word of God. Then you end up with a man-made religion. Yeshua said, I did not come to destroy the Torah or the prophets. I came to fulfill all that is written of him in the Torah and in the prophets. All that is written. The first time he came as a suffering servant. They stumbled at that. But that's not the end. Have they stumbled that they should fall or utterly be destroyed and be cast off? No, God forbid. 
but rather through their fall, their stumbling, salvation has come to the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy, to provoke Israel to jealousy. And this is what this series is all about, because I have been provoked to jealousy. I have been provoked to be fiercely protective of these scriptures and these records which were written by Jews, they were written to Israelites, and they were written about the apostles, the Jewish apostles who went out and gave the good news to the Gentile world, those who are without God and without hope, who had no idea. They were separated from the commandments of God, separated from the commonwealth of Israel, without God and without hope in this world. And yet when the word went out to them, then they started mixing it in with their pagan sun god worship, started mixing it in with their culture, and finally we have the end result of what Yeshua said. I did not come to destroy the Torah and the prophets, but to fulfill. One jot, one tittle, one vowel, one consonant will not pass on the Torah till all is fulfilled. And I've even heard Gentiles teach that all has been fulfilled. You've got to be dumber than dirt to even come up with that. You have to be completely ignorant of that which is written in the Torah, in the prophets, to say that all has been fulfilled, because it all has not been fulfilled. Yeshua came and fulfilled the details concerning the spring feast of the Lord, but he hasn't fulfilled the fall feast of the Lord. He hasn't fulfilled that which he says is going to happen in the book of the Revelation, when he takes over the charge of this earth, when he destroys Cast Satan into a boundless pit for a thousand years when he rains wrath down upon the earth and levels the mountains and levels the cities to prepare for him to come back and to reign upon the earth for a thousand years. That is what the prophets speak of. This has not happened yet. And yet, it will. It will take place. I go back to verse 11. Have they stumbled that they should altogether fall and be destroyed? God forbid. But rather, through their fall, their, their stumbling, through their, for their difficulty in stumbling over the stumbling stone that was set before them, salvation, Wholeness has come to the Gentiles to provoke the the Jews to jealousy, to provoke Israel to jealousy specifically. It's not just Jews, it's Israel. And we have to make that distinction accurately. All of Israel are not Jews, but all Jews are of Israel, or they're at least supposed to be. There are those who say they're Jews, but they're not even Israel as we read about in the book of the Revelation. They say they're Jewish, they say they're Jews, but they're not even Israel. They don't keep the commandments of God. They don't follow the faith of Abraham. They may have bloodline, they may be bloodline Jewish, but what does that mean? The promises were made to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Those who lived in the land of Judea became known as Judeans, the short form as Jews, and the Jews, Judeans, were carried away into Babylon. But long before then, the 10 northern tribes of Israel were carried away by Shalmaneser and dispersed through the Gentile nations. As the prophets say that the Israel would be sifted among the nations, not just Judeans, but all Israel, sifted among the nations. And that's why we see cropping up people that that understand their background, that that they have Jewish in their background, and people that, that are cropping up in other parts of the world and realize that Israel is part of their background, sifted among the nations. And when you sift them among the nations, you're not going to be able to tell the difference between an Israelite and a Gentile, because the cultures get sifted together. But yet, the Almighty knows his people. He knows whom he has called. 
in all of Israel has not been cast away. The people that he knew foreknew and he made promises to, he is going to fulfill those promises. And part of those promises is that Israel will be brought back into the land and that they will inherit all of the land that was promised to Abraham from the Euphrates River to the Nile River, the great river in Egypt, all of that land. We have never possessed all of that land. We were told, Moses was told, and Joshua was instructed, you're not going to get all the land all at once. It's going to be given to you little by little, little by little, because your number is not sufficient to inhabit all the land, and the wild beast would, would, would come and take over if I were to wipe out all your enemies all at once and just give you the land, it would grow up wild because there'd be no one to tend it. But the Almighty has made a promise to Israel And these are the promises that that we're going to see as we go into the book of Acts. Now, if the fall, the fall, the stumbling, let's, let's use it correctly in the context, the stumbling of Israel over the cornerstone, if their stumbling be the riches of the world, a benefit to the Gentiles, how much more their fullness, how much more their restoration. When the promises to Israel and that Israel is brought back into their land and Israel is restored to the nation of Israel, how much more their fullness. We're gonna see this is in the very first chapter of the book of Acts. Then Paul says, for I speak to you Gentiles. Now, verse 15, speaking to the Gentiles, if the casting away of them, of Israel, be the reconciliation of the world, reconcile, bringing back the world to God, if this is what has happened, if their casting away, if their stumbling has brought more Gentiles in reconciling the world, the Gentiles, to to God, what shall be the receiving of them but life from the dead? When Israel's promises, the promises made to Israel are fulfilled, it is gonna be like life from the dead. You think that the Gentiles getting a glimpse of the scripture right now is good, wait until Israel, the promises are fulfilled to Israel. It is going to be like life from the dead. Verse 17, and if some of the branches were broken off, and that's that's what happens. Israel, it's not every one of them, not all of them are are going to to, to recognize uh, throughout all time and, and and be joined and reconciled to God. You know, they've stumbled. They've stumbled and gone off the path. Now, if some of the branches are broken off, and you, you Gentiles, being a wild olive tree, but yet were grafted in among them, grafted into that, and you partake of the root and fatness of the olive tree, do not boast yourself over and above the branches. But if you boast, bear this in mind. You don't bear the root, the root bears you. Israel is the root. Israel is the tree, the trunk, the original vine. And you are a wild olive branch, and I have experience in grafting different kind of fruits onto different trees and in and, and, uh, in orchard work when I was uh, uh, much younger. And this was my job in the orchard, is to graft in branches from different apple trees into another stock so that the root and the fatness, the sap would flow into that, and then it would produce a different kind of fruit. And that is why we have so many fruits, and especially apples today. The apples they have hybridized them by grafting in different 
apple tree branches into different roots, into different trunks, and when the sap flows through it, it produces a different fruit. And so he was speaking of this because this, this is an ancient technique, is that the Gentiles are wild olive branch. They are not of the root and the branch of Israel. They are wild. They've grown up wild. As he goes on to say, you're, you're without God and without hope. This is how you've been raised. You have been raised, I think it says in, in Corinthians chapter 12, that you were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols even as you were led. You were raised in a pagan culture and you were led to worship dumb idols and you need to renew your mind. You need to, as it says, you need to get grafted into the original root so that the, the sap of the root of Israel flows into you. Yeshua also spoke of this in the, the last night that he was with his disciples. He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If you are cut off, if you are cut off from the vine, through unbelief, as it will go on to say, Israel, who was, some of the branches were cut off because of unbelief. And because of that, they were no longer tapped into the root and the branch. No longer did the sap flow through them, and so they died. They withered up. So Yeshua says, if you abide in me and I abide in you, my, my sap flows into your veins, into that tree, then you are going to bring forth much fruit. But if you don't abide in me, if you don't get grafted in, as the Gentiles have to get grafted in, and if you don't maintain that flow that comes from the root of Israel, because Yeshua is the is from Israel, he is from that root, from the tribe of Judah, the oracles, the living oracles of God committed to Israel, committed to the Jews, if you don't let that flow through you, then you are going to wither and die. You will not bring forth much fruit. And this is what we have happening in the Christian world today. I have... I am amazed at the gross gross ignorance, the gross ignorance of the Christian world. They have developed a religion in which they have little numbered sound bites that they pull out of their hat and they filter everything through these five or six verses. Five or six verses and, and not understanding the, how the whole thing works. Because the whole thing is the root and the branch of Israel. And if you are, have cut yourself off from Israel and decide that you're gonna stand on your own and, and just as your own little Gentile tree, you're not gonna bear any fruit. You're, you're gonna end up, you know, the, the whole gospel of the kingdom to most Christians is you do a repeat after me prayer, accept Jesus and ask him to come into your heart and then you're saved and then you're gonna go to heaven when you die. And that's it. And so maybe you have to go to church, I don't know, some places you have to go to church in order to continue to be fed by this Gentile root. But blindness in part has happened to the Gentiles. And that is what I want to share with you as we go through the book of Acts. So please stay with me. Some of the branches were broken off. I'll go back to verse 17. And you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them. And you partake now in the root and the fatness of the olive tree. But you don't boast yourself above the branches. You don't bear the root, the root bears you. You're not the big person on the block. Verse 19, thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off that we might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off. They didn't believe, they didn't believe, they stumbled, they stumbled 
at the cornerstone. And so they were broken off. They didn't abide in him. And they didn't believe. They didn't hear and obey Yeshua as the prophet we must hear and obey. And Paul Peter says on the day of Pentecost, those who do not hear and obey that prophet will be destroyed. They will be broken off. They will be separated from Israel because he is the root and the stock and the branch of Israel. You get grafted into him or you're gonna die. Because of unbelief, they were broken off. And you stand by faith. And that's how the Gentiles enter in, by faith. By faith that this is the provision of Yehovah. Yeshua is the provision of Yehovah. And believing in him, in his provision, that by his stripes we were healed. By his blood he has sanctified us and cleansed us and brought us in and made us fellow heirs and of the same household. He has grafted us in. So, you stand by faith, so don't be high-minded, but you better fear, you better fear and respect, because if God did not spare the natural branches, Israel, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Therefore, behold the goodness and the severity of God. On them fell severity. He was severe with them. He said, you obey me or you'll be cut off. You hear and obey the words of the prophet or you will be cut off. But otherwise, the goodness upon you has fell, fallen the goodness. If you continue in his goodness, otherwise you too will be cut off. And this is the sorry state of Gentile Churchianity today, they don't bear any fruit. They have been cut off. They are dumber than dirt when it comes to the scriptures. They couldn't find the rear end with both hands in the dark when it comes to understanding the book of Acts because they filter it through their nonsense replacement theology, thinking that they're the big cheese on the block. They are the big branch in Israel. Oh, they those stupid Jews, that stupid Israel. How many times do I hear them week after week going to church? Oh, Israel. Oh, the Pharisees, all this. And I, I sit there and I'm just steaming because you moron. I just want to say, you morons, you, you have no idea what you're talking about. And you're blaming everything on the Jews on the Israel who is God's chosen people, you think they are so stupid? Well, no. The blindness and that's happened to the Gentiles is so deep, so pervasive, and they have built an entire religious system on them thinking and boasting themselves above Israel. Not even getting grafted in and letting the sap, the nourishment, the word of God from Israel flow into their veins, into their minds. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You have got to change your mind. You've got to be renewed. You've got to get tapped into the root. This is not a Gentile book. It wasn't written by Gentiles. It wasn't written for Gentiles. It was written for Israel, by Israelites. Israelites, holy men of God, holy men of Israel who were moved by the Holy Spirit. Let the Jews and let Israel interpret the scriptures the, the Jews and Israel wrote and we'll give plenty of time for the Gentiles to interpret all the scriptures they wrote, which is none, including the book of Acts. It wasn't written by a Gentile. Luke was not a Gentile. I'm gonna share that with you in just a little bit. So if you don't continue in his goodness, if you don't continue nourishing yourself from the root and the sap of the tree of Israel, if you don't do that, then you too will be cut off. 
In verse 23, and they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, they will be grafted in. Israel can be grafted in and so much easier. Israel, it's simple for Israel to be grafted into the root. But the Gentiles who are not grafted into the root, who don't understand the scriptures, who thinks it's a just a numbered song, but you do a repeat after me prayer and that's all there is to it. If that, if they, if the Gentiles would just teach the scripture, then Israel would easily be grafted in. And my experience is, especially living in the Galilee for 14 years, is the Jews in the Galilee are not hearing about the real Yeshua from the Christians. They're given a Gentile, a paganized Jesus, but we're not, no one is teaching what Yeshua taught. If they taught what Yeshua taught, the doors would be open, and they were. They were to me. Jews, Israelites in the Galilee, who came to the Messiah because they understood, as as I taught, that Yeshua vehemently, repeatedly violated every rule and regulations that the Pharisees, everything he could break, he did break. He was constantly breaking the rules and regulations because they are in violation of what Moses taught. And when I taught what Yeshua taught, the lights came on. They were so easily grafted in because it's the natural tree, they're grafted in. But they have to be led around the stumbling stone, led around it to see that that stumbling stone is the Messiah coming the first time as a suffering servant. But if the Christians would show how he came not only as a suffering servant, but as the prophet who we must hear and obey, and if the Christians would hear and obey him and do what he said to do and live like he said to to live and walk as he walked, then they would be a light to the Gentiles and the Gentiles would be grafted in. Verse 24, for if you were cut, if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which are the natural branches, that they are grafted into the olive tree? For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. He's going to show them something that has not been revealed beforehand. It's a mystery or cannot be revealed to the novices or the uninitiated. And that's why I'm doing this for you as the the, the teaching for you who are invested in this ministry and want to understand this because This is not for the uninitiated. This is not for the newcomer. This is a mystery. I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery, Paul says, lest you be wise in your own conceitedness. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. And then shall all of Israel be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and he shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant to them, to Israel, when I shall take away their sins. He is going to save his people Israel. He is going to reveal himself to all of Israel. They shall look on him of whom they have pierced. And this, this testimony that God buried in the earth, the testimony that is greater than the testimony of men, this testimony that John speaks of in his epistle of John, this testimony that he saw when the earth quaked and the rocks rent as he stood at the foot of the cross and he saw the blood and the water come out of Messiah's side down through that earthquake crack, 
in that testimony that is down in the earth, the Ark of the Covenant that was hidden by Jeremiah down in a chamber underneath the crucifixion site where the blood and the water of Yeshua coming out of his side fell upon the Ark of the Covenant. When that testimony is revealed to the world and revealed to Israel, they will know, they will understand. Out of Zion will come their deliverer. Their deliverer came and their deliverer will return. He will make himself known. This is why it is so important that we understand the words of the prophets, not from a Gentile perspective, but that we go back into the words of the prophets and see how Yeshua fulfilled these things. And why Jeremiah, as Baruch records, that Jeremiah hides the Ark of the Covenant in the cave that he bought from Hanamiel, his cousin. And he hides the tabernacle of David. And that Amos says that the tabernacle of David will be rebuilt. Isaiah says that the king will set upon his throne the Ark of the Covenant. These are things that will happen in the future. There are also some intermediate revealings that will happen in the future. But all these things have to be understood, but they can't be understood unless we understand the book of the Acts. Shalom, Torah fans. Give this video a thumbs up and share it with a friend. Tap the subscription button and the bell icon, and I promise to update weekly with in-depth biblical research. Be sure to download the new michaelrood.tv app for both mobile and home devices for even more commercial-free content.